You know, we're continuing on this message series through this summer as we journey with Abraham. And I promise you, we're getting really close to the name switch. We've been going with Abram up to this point. We're really close to him becoming Abraham. But right now, we just finished last week and the week before. He went through some famine. He went through this hardship where he kind of raised up an army to go rescue his, his nephew Lot in what was the world's first world war, a serious battle. And you can just imagine how he was so overwhelmed. And now he goes into this little dialogue with God, if you will, where he kind of uh, really wrestles with his faith, wrestles with his trust. And it begins here in Genesis 15, verse 1. After all that happened, after the famine in Canaan, after he fought these enemies and rescued his, his nephew Lot, after he had the encounter with the priest King Melchizedek that we talked about last week, God spoke to Abram. And it says, after this, after all that, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. I'm sure like there's that moment where Abram's like, after he just went through all that stuff and God says, See, hey, Abram, don't be afraid. <laughs> yeah, are you serious, God? Do you know what I just went through? Do you, I don't even know what's ahead of me. How, how can I not be afraid? And I feel the heartbeat of we get, as we get into this dialogue and, and this wrestling that Abram reveals from within his heart towards God, I think we all can relate to it. I, I bet if, if you're a human, which I'm safe to assume that pretty much everybody here is human, right? Okay, okay, we got that cleared. That we all struggle with the same thing. It may be different circumstances or different ways we struggle with it, but the heartbeat of the struggle here is the same. And it all starts with God saying, don't be afraid. Uh, seriously? Have you seen my circumstances? Have you seen what I'm going through? I, I don't know how this is all going to work out. I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. This life is not easy Life is overwhelming. And God told Abram, don't be afraid. And Abram's like, I just went through a serious famine, serious battle, major battle, so hardship. Emotionally, I'm just beat down. Physically, I'm so worn out. Don't be afraid, God says, because I am your shield. That word shield is a powerful word. It can actually be translated as sovereign. All authority. In fact, what God's saying here is, Abram, do not be afraid because I am sovereign. I'm in control. That's what sovereign is. It's full control over everything. In Psalm 103, it says that God's kingdom rules over everything. No government of this world is in control. God's kingdom rules over everything. And what God's saying to Abram, do not be afraid because I am sovereign. And through my sovereignty is your reward. That's what that verse really says. When you think of the power there. But Abram, like many of us, we wrestle with this. And what we see here with God's sovereignty and the reality of this is that his sovereignty provides confidence for what is in our future. It gives us the ability to have a foundation that I have confidence. I have peace from my fear. I have comfort. I have strength that no matter what comes my way, no matter what I'm about to walk through, I am confident because God is sovereign. And through his sovereignty, I have a reward. He's got me. And he's got something big for me. And see, there's a difference here. This is where the battle begins. A lot of us live in this realm where, with the knowledge, God's sovereign. I, I read it. I've seen it. I, I get that. I mean, the Bible says so. And I have a knowledge of that. I have a knowledge where the Bible says, don't be afraid. That's great, God. But we live in knowledge. And there's a difference in this faith journey when knowledge turns into confidence. And the problem is when you live in knowledge and you don't walk into confidence, it's like, I know that, but can I really trust it? 
Or should I trust in myself and what I can do and what I can build and what I can do to achieve and what I can obtain? And I think this is where the battle begins. Do we simply just know it or are we confident in it? We're confident that the world can throw whatever they want at us, but God is sovereign. He's in control. Because through his sovereignty is a great reward. Because he's full of promises. He, he, he's, got, he's got the future for us. And this is where the tension builds. This is where the tension, we see that as we begin this journey, we see the tension in Abram and it's just building and building and building. And I bet if all of us really look at this through the lens of our journey, our circumstances, our life, we see within ourselves the same exact tension. And that tension is how we relate to the sovereignty of God. How we relate to who God is. Do we relate to God through the law I can do it, I build my own self, I achieve it, that attitude. Or do we relate to the, to the sovereignty of God through grace? I can't, but he can. Everything is because of him. My victory is because of him. My journey is for him. There's the big difference, and there lies the tension. Because throughout the scripture and what we see revealed in Abram's journey right now is that we are saved by grace, justified through faith. But what does that mean? What does that mean for my life, my journey today in 2024 and all the junk I have to walk through? You see, justified means there's this removal of guilt, this removal of shame. I am, I, I am no longer condemned to hell. But still, that develops this tension. The tension in our relation with God's sovereignty develops this conflict, this conflict with trust. Do I simply just know it or do I trust it? Do I trust it in every step I take? And what happens is this tension of trust develops because we view everything through our circumstances. That's what Abram was doing as we begin this journey today. He was looking through everything through his circumstance. God, you said I'm going to be the father of many nations, but do you realize I'm 100 years old, no kids, can't happen, God. That's what we see begin to play out. And I think if we're going to be honest, we wrestle with that too. God, do you not see the situation I'm in? I know the laws of physics. I know how things work. I know it just can't happen. It won't. That's what we convince ourselves, and that's where the tension develops. Genesis 15, 2. Abram replied to God after God said, God, don't, or Abram, don't be afraid. I am sovereign, and, my, and your reward's through my sovereignty. And Abram replies, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus, a servant of his? In other words, I have nobody past myself to. You promised me all this, but it's not happening. I've got nothing. I'm empty is basically what he's saying. And he asked this question that is in the heart of all of us. I believe if we're going to be honest with ourselves today, we all wrestle with the same question that Abram asked right to God right here in this verse. God, what can you actually give to me? What can you do for me? I see in my circumstance, and this has been going on for a long time, it's not changing. You haven't come through for this for me ever. So what can you actually do for me? That's the heart of Abram's battle right now. We see here this tension that Abram's starting to release to God through all the stuff he's walked through. And he's viewing it all through his circumstances. I'm childless. I'm old. I get the law of nature. It's just not going to work. This is it, God. So what can you do? And behind all that, as we peel back all those questioning, there is an accusation. 
And whether you realize it or not, we all get to this place within our argument with God in a a place of an accusation. Whether we actually speak it or it's just kind of in there and everything else is just kind of pushing it out. And that accusation that we see here with Abram is the same accusation that we give to God when we look at our circumstances and we ask the question, God, what can you give? And that accusation is, God, you failed me. You let me down. You said you're going to do this and I haven't seen it. This is my circumstances. What can you give me? You failed me. For Abram, he said, I cannot have children. I can't. I'm too old. Basically saying, I missed that chance. That is over. My life's about done. And my question for you as we kind of make this a little bit real Deep within your own heart, what accusation do you make towards God? We need to peel this back and be real with it because it's there. Every one of us has something in there. And we guilt ourselves because of our own pursuit of righteousness. I can't be real with that when God's saying, no, 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 let's peel the curtain open and let's be real. Because I want to show you something through that. God desperately wants you to be real with him. So stop holding back. And connect with the creator of all. The sovereign God. And that's what Abram's doing right now. And behind all of this, this working gut and this feeling that you failed me and I can't have this. Builds into Abram's question, what can you do for me? What can you give me? What, what can you do? God. And this lies the conflict of trust. You see, the conflict of trust, what it does is it develops doubts. It develops questions regarding God's faithfulness. We start to question God, are you really faithful? I mean, sovereign God, I know you're sovereign. I know you're in control, but can I trust you that you will do it? I I got the knowledge, but I don't have the confidence And at some point in my journey, I need to develop a confidence that this God who says he is what he is, that he will come through for me. That he will deliver on his promise. Abram's accusation, you failed me, led to this doubt, led to this questioning that developed this conflict of trust that was in him and that was just pouring out right now. And as he got real with this, as he started just to open himself up to the sovereign God and say, God, I'm just being honest with you right now. What can you give me? Through that, we begin to see God's faithfulness and a glimpse of the reality of his promises. The next few verses, God circles back to Abram and says, let me remind you what I'm going to give to you. Let me remind you what I'm going to do for you. Let me remind you how I'm going to come through for you. And then starting in verse 6, the Bible says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, sovereign Lord. Here comes another question. How can I know that I will gain possession of it? How can I know this this will happen? You see, Abram, the Bible says he believed the journey began. He believed. God, I, I get it. I have the knowledge. I understand it. I'm beginning to take those steps in your faithfulness. And the Bible says God credited to him as righteousness. We're going to circle back around to that because that's a very, very important part of this whole process. But getting to Abram in this moment, God reminded Abraham of his faithfulness. Listen, I'm going to come through for you. I'm going to take care of you. And Abram comes back with a question we all wrestle with as we have this conflict of trust in our own heart. And that is how How can I know? In other words, I need the facts. I want the details. I want you to prove it. How can I know that you will come through for me? 
How can I trust that? And here is this tension between belief and knowledge to trust and confidence. Now it's going to drive my behaviors. Now it's going to drive the steps I take. Now it's going to drive who I am. And see, here's the struggle. It's always been around. Here's a, here's a bad philosophy that's always been a, in existence. And that is this understanding of this idea that faith is blindly trusting this God and walking with him. Just saying, you know, I don't really get it, but, but I just got to trust you. So I got to do this and figure it out as I go. And that's what we've convinced ourselves in our world. That faith is just this blind trust in God. But that is absolutely wrong. What we see throughout scripture and what we see here in Abram's journey is this. Faith is not this blind belief of God, I'll just walk with you. No, what we see here is faith is developed on the reality of God's faithfulness. And what God's doing for Abram in this moment is, Abram, did you not forget? Did you forget? Do you not remember? How I walked you through that famine? And took care of you through the biggest threat this world has ever seen that took your, your nephew Lot. No one could, could match this evil empire's might, but you did. You know why? Because I did. And what we see here is that faith is actually built on the facts of God's faithfulness. And we have to wrestle through that so that we are not blurred by our circumstances, but beyond our circumstances, we see the reality that God is faithful. He's sovereign. He is good. And that belief in that leads to this faith. And faith is action. Faith is surrendering ourselves to him and walking in obedience to the sovereign God. God, because you have come through, because you were here, I know you will be here too. And so I trust you because of what I have seen I have confidence to walk with you. And, and, and in this conflict of trust is this tension between this belief and faith. Do I just know it or do I trust and have confidence to walk with you, sovereign God? Do I have confidence? I know you can, but do I have confidence in you will? And will I walk with you? And through there, God began to dialogue with Abram more. And he began to make a covenant with Abram and say, I've got you. And I've got great things for you. And I'm going to pour out my blessings to you. And through your offspring, it's not just about you having more kids. It's about, this is a spiritual thing. This is bigger than this. We always just focus on our circumstances and keep things from a more physical sense. But God's saying, no, Abram, there's something bigger here. There's a spiritual, there's an eternal aspect to this. My blessings are not just this world. My blessings are eternity. And what I'm delivering through you is the spiritual reality into this world. And through your offspring, Abraham, through your offspring, you, they will know me. They will come to believe in me. They will follow me because eventually it comes to the cross. My righteousness revealed through my son Jesus. And generation upon end generation, the groundwork you lay, Abraham, they will know me. That's the beauty of what I have. And God gave him that vision and he made a covenant with him that he made the seal of that covenant circumcision. Well, we won't even get into those details today. <laughs> but what we see here is the, a paradigm. The paradigm of grace. Saved by grace, justified by faith. This is the paradigm of grace, which just builds this tension this overwhelming tension of how we relate to God. Through the law, I do this, I build this, I achieve this. Or through grace, God does it.
You see, the law is all built out of works and wages and obligations and boasting and sin and wrath. And grace is built out of faith and the gift and glorifying God, which we see in Genesis 15, how Abram glorified God when he saw the promises and, and, and the forgiveness. And that's what builds into grace. And we see this paradigm of grace that Abram's wrestling through and what he's journeying through. And, and we see this play out later on as Paul brings up in, in Romans 4 that we'll get to in a moment. But through all this is is this tension that we walk in today. We may not say it, those words, I'm struggling with law and grace. We may not phrase it that way, but deep down in our hearts, we walk that way. We wrestle with that tension every single day, trying to achieve and understand God's promise. And hear me clearly, friends, God's ultimate promise is righteousness. Through this whole journey, his promise that he is leading Abraham to, what he's constantly saying, Abram, I have great things for you. I'm going to overwhelm you with my blessings. I'm going to overwhelm you. And what he's overwhelming him with is his righteousness. His righteousness. God promised that through him, all those who believe are heirs to his blessings of righteousness that's centered on the cross. That's centered on the reality of Jesus. You see, he's justified by faith. Justification is that removal of the guilt and that condemnation. And righteousness is that I am right before God because of my debt and all that I brought onto myself. The law has requirements. And now because of this, because of the righteousness, I am free from my guilt and I stand innocent. I stand free. I stand with confidence of what lies ahead. And I fear we so often beat up ourselves and we live lives walking in guilt and condemnation because we don't even realize we're walking in the law where we're trying to earn it all on ourselves. And we just live condemned and broken and guilt full, full of guilt simply because we recognize I can't, I can't do it. I can't earn that. I can't be, I can't earn righteousness. And God's saying, I know. I'm right here. I'm right here to walk you through it. And I am sovereign, and through my sovereignty are my rewards. I've got you. I've got you. See, Paul dealt with this in Romans chapter 4. I, my homework for you this week is to read through Romans 4. We're going to hit some things on there, but really get into it. Read Romans 4 this week because Paul deals with this because throughout the whole Jewish culture up to this point, they built themselves around the law. They believe Abraham was saved by the law. They believe everything was through the law. And Abraham's like, no, no, no. Or Paul's saying, no, no, no. Don't you see what happened here? We're all saved by grace. And he walks through that journey. Romans 4, 1 through 3, Paul wrote, What then shall we say that Abraham, Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. See, Paul's re- highlighting, hey, Abraham believed And through that belief, he was credited as righteousness. And this belief is a deeper understanding, not just a knowledge. Hey, I get this. Oh, that's pretty cool. That belief that Paul's highlighting here is a surrender. You see, in this moment, Abraham moved from knowledge to confidence and fully surrendered to this God, the sovereign God. And said, I trust you. And that full surrender led to faith. And faith is action. Faith is obedience. Faith is I am walking with you. You see, faith is obedience. It's built out of that belief and this faithfulness that God is sovereign. And from there, through his sovereignty, God highlighted his reward. I am crediting you as righteousness. You stand innocent because of me. 
You stand innocent because of what I am doing and what my son will do and has done. You stand innocent. And that credit of righteousness is basically like, I am putting down something on your debt. You have a debt. And so it's this Greek term, this, the Hebrew word there, or the Greek word there is this term that the Greek used from a business standpoint that was like, I am paying off your debt. So when you go to the bank, you're free. There's no more debt. You are good to go. And through this pattern of grace, this paradigm of grace, and the tension that Abraham walked through, we see this man Abraham humbly believe that God could and would keep his word. And so he trusted him and was confidently surrendering himself to him and walked with him. And he experienced God's righteousness. You see, there's two ways we can obtain the credit to righteousness. You can either try to live an absolutely perfect life and obtain it yourself, or you can surrender yourself to God and receive his grace. Paul continues on some other verses there I just want to share with you. Romans 4.13. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. Romans, uh, verses 18 through 21, Paul writes this. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so, so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening his, in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. And since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded. See the grace playing out here? Being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. I love the way Paul words this. Abram, against all hope. In other words, Abram had a chance to be real with his circumstances. Because if I view my whole life through my current circumstances, there is no hope. I can't do it. There's no victory. And I fear so many of us, we have weakened faith, as Paul writes about there, because we view our lives and our world through our circumstances. and our circumstances, there is no hope. But against hope, Abraham had hope. So what was the difference? You see, he took off his lens of the law and put on his lens of grace and began to look beyond his circumstances to a sovereign God. He's saying, God, not only do I know you can, but I have full confidence in how you will come through. That my victory is not really in these circumstances. My victory is beyond these circumstances in you. You have something bigger for me. And you see, to trust in a person's promises requires believing that they not only have the power to keep them, but they also will keep them. And I fear that maybe some of us here today, we may have a knowledge of, hey, God has the sovereignty, he has the power to keep his, to, to keep his promises. But do I have confidence and trust that he will? And that's where it goes back to building the reality of seeing God's faithfulness. How God has come through for you, just like what Abram had to walk through. Oh yeah, I'm just seeing things through my current circumstances that I forgot how you did this and you came through here and you, you showed up here. And so because you did this and this and we're here, I can have confidence in what I'm about to walk through. I have confidence in who you are. Paul wrote in verses 22 to 25 of Romans 4, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but for also for us. Yoo-hoo, you and me. 
to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus from our, our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins. See, he's highlighting how everything comes to the cross, everything circles around the cross, and the reality of Jesus who raised to life for our justification to remove that condemnation. Through him, we have victory over the circumstances of our lives and our world. That's what he's saying. But like Abraham, we all walk through this tension of trust and this conflict of trust and this tension of, I know, but do I trust and do I have confidence? And so as we wrap up, I I bet there's some people here in different categories. Some of you may be sitting here today and quite honestly, you're in a world overwhelmed by the circumstances of your life. And you've just been beat down. And right now, like Abram, you're really struggling with a lot of questions and the doubts. And maybe if you're going to be honest, maybe you have some accusations towards God. God, you failed me. First, can I say, don't feel guilty for wrestling with that because we all have. I have many times. It's normal. It's natural. It's human. But don't stuff it and hide from it or run from it. I want you to know there's people at this church who would love to sit down. We're not afraid of your questions, your doubts, or your accusations. We would just love to have, a t- have an opportunity. Just, let's talk it through. Let's together go to Jesus. We may not have all the answers for you, but we promise we'll walk with you. Let's walk with you through those hard questions. Because I trust and have full confidence in the faithfulness of God. He's got you. And he loves you. Some of you have been working through that and you're living in the world of I know, but do I have confidence? And maybe you need to get to a place where you fully surrender to him. You've been trying to do this and achieve righteousness or overcome your circumstances on your own. And now's the time to say, I can't. But I know a guy who can. And it's time to fully surrender to him. Not just... No, he can, but walk confidently in obedience that he will. And what greater way to fully surrender to him than to be baptized? As Paul writes in a couple chapters later in Romans 6, to identify ourselves in Jesus through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Maybe today you're someone who just says, I need to fully surrender. I'm trying to do this on my own. I'm trying to create this on my own and I need to fully surrender to him. If that's you, if you're someone there that either has questions, doubts, or needs things to talk through, or you're someone who's like, I'm ready to fully surrender to him, our leaders will be at the Engage Impact. We will love to just pray with you, talk with you, and whatever it is that you need to start walking through, we want to walk with you. But don't let this day go by without coming to him and being real with God on this and see the faithfulness and see the victory come from him. Let's pray together. Father, you are such a good God. And I praise you for who you are. I praise you for your faithfulness. God, I pray for those people in this place right now who are struggling with questions and doubts and accusations. Because of their circumstances, it's really hard. Because of our circumstances, it's hard to see your faithfulness. Lord, I pray you break through that, that they may experience you. Lord, I pray right now for those that have been building up walls of trying to do life on their own or earning their own righteousness. Father, I pray that today they may tear down those walls and fully surrender to you. And like Abram, walk obediently with you. And that through that they may experience the victory of your righteousness. It's in your name we pray. Amen.